Hello and welcome back to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent episode and guest for you, but before I go ahead, let me remind you to subscribe to the channel, check out all the previous content and magnificent guests, and also let me acknowledge our partners, Digital Health Platform, Clinic Touch V, and our series partner, Fujifilm Healthcare. And today I have a very special guest for you, and we have Matthew Old is the publisher of the Healthcare blog. Matthew, how are you? I'm doing fine, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Looking forward to uh, chatting. It's been a long time. We, we we met in Barcelona years ago, you reminded me, and uh, um, now we're both marooned. You're in Brighton uh, <laughs> and I'm in the US, even though I'm the English guy and you're the Portuguese guy. So we're both in the wrong place. <laughs> Funny world and Matthew, we're talking about uh, we're talking before the the recording about you one of these people that I feel like I know very well, but we we met a long time ago in Barcelona. But you're very active in the industry and also I follow your work and the tweet and in social media and everything. So well, and and the same with you, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, good to, good good to connect. Matthew, today we are here to discuss health policy and the future care delivery, and I'm going to go straight to the questions, okay? Sure. The first question that I have for you is, we talk about the health care delivery of the future, but can you shed some light on flipping the stock in the continuous clinic, please? Oh, sure. Well, these are two uh, concepts that I came up with, one with uh, my, my colleague at Health 2.0, Indu, Indu Subaya. So flipping the stack is really about technology. Um, and that's really about how what's happening is that uh, we have now developed technology that's all over the place in the home, uh, in the air. You know, I'm talking about things like Wi Fi, obviously phones, sensors. And, and as you're seeing, more and more uh, connected testing and your space connected wearables, right, coming into the home. So you've seen this big explosion in remote patient monitoring. You've seen this big explosion in various different types of uh, ways of capturing information, monitoring, managing, messaging, and, uh, 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 and managing essentially patients. So if you go back to ancient history or even most healthcare today, but certainly ancient history, right? Healthcare happened between one patient, one clinician, doctor in, at one time in one place. Um, it, uh, and so what at that point, eventually we started layering on top of that services, uh, other things around that, uh, nurse advice lines, information, whatever, but still basically the clinician visit either in a hospital or in a clinic was the cornerstone of healthcare. And, 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 and frankly, still is right. And then eventually over the last 20, 30 years, 20 years, and mostly the last 10 years, we've led technology on top of all of that visit to try and figure out to count for what's going on during the visit we haven't fundamentally changed that visit as being the core of what we're doing so if you think of you know visits other services and then technology as being the stack now we have all this different technology and we're available to put all this technology in different places uh we should be able to track people using that technology pretty much 24 7 especially people who are relatively sick right have chronic illness or need a lot more care and we should be allowing automation to do much of that tracking. So what I think of as flipping the stack is now saying, well, that technology should be the base layer. Other services, when you need stuff, the technology should be tracking and, and look, monitoring in the background. And when it notices, the technology notices that somebody is out of whack, you know, they have a measurement, they have a blood pressure reading or a, or a, or a uh, blood sugar reading that's out of whack, they may need some intervention. Then you get a service and the service may well be a call from a nurse it may be a telehealth visit it may be a, a home visit who knows some kind of human intervention but the doctor and patient together in the room whether it's a, a clinician whether it's in a clinic you know for an outpatient visit or in the hospital that should be like the last thing we do that should be not the, the primary thing that should be like a, a a thing that happens only in the most serious cases when something really has gone wrong in the rest of the system so and that's what we mean by flipping the stack overall. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so, so much for that. 
Thank you. And, and, and I mean, so the continuous clinic really is what, if you were to say right now we have a series of organizations that are set up, hospitals and doctors are set up prim- across Western medicine primarily, but certainly in the US are set up to uh, manage the process of those visits, right? Literally, uh, you know, patients, doctors get paid by what they do in those visits. Um, hospitals get paid by what happens when people are in the hospital. No one cares about what happens, you know, out, outside where most care is actually, you know, where most life is going on or most care is needed. So what I've been talking about as a continuous clinic is can we create an organization that can manage this sort of flips, flipping of the stack, that can manage all that technology, that can bring appropriate resources to people at the home when they need them and can, you know, use medical clinical professionals, but only when they need them at, at the sort of last, as the last resort. So the continuous clinics are what I call those organizations that think about how do you manage somebody who needs care as much as they need, you know, and where they need it, which may be in the home, at their job, you know, any third place they go, and maybe only a little bit in the clinic or in the hospital. So that's the goal. That We don't really have these continuous clinics yet, but you can see them slowly starting to form uh, in the ecosystem at the moment. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Matthew. It's certainly a new pattern to deliver care wherever we are, isn't it? And uh, uh, healthcare is shifting in that direction to address the patient in the comfort of the home or between the walls of an office or anywhere but the hospital. Thank you so much for that brilliant insight. And the, the second question that I have for you is, what do you predict that the care continuum would look like in 10 years time? Oh, this is a tough one because in general, as you know, the healthcare system hates to change, hates to move, takes forever. It's dominated by these large institutions, which are very politically powerful. Um, It's dominated by these professions, which are very, very slow to move. So, you know, when you say, oh, it's going to be like, it's obvious that it should, you know, because it could be like this, it should be like this, uh, it will be like, it should be like, you know, it could be like this, it should be like this, and therefore it will be like this. That's a, that's a bold prediction to make. Having said that, I think uh, the, 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 the sclerotic, you know, existence of the current healthcare system is at this point getting close to the breaking point. Um, certainly in the US, we, you know, there is the, the cost of care is dramatic and the, the outcomes are not very good. And there's a lot of interest in these new models. Now, I'm not sure that interest is yet translated to changes in the way the government funds things or the way that they pay doctors, but you can start to see interest, you know, it's called value based care, hasn't got anywhere close to taking over yet, but it's starting to come. So I think in 10 years time, significant portions of of americans maybe not a majority significant portions will be in what are you know virtual first hybrid care arrangements where most of the care they get and receive is going to be delivered online and their care is going to be quite carefully managed and monitored by outside agencies whether they be health plans hospitals new kinds of companies so if you're a relatively, you know, most people are relatively healthy and don't interact with the healthcare system that much, right? So for those people, um, when they have a need for an acute, acute visit or, you know, a, 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 minor, a minor illness or something that, that you know, that, 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 that can be actually corrected quite quickly, I think the first place most of those people go, which used to be their primary care doctor, then became like the urgent care center, that will now be some kind of online system which manages them. I think, you know, if you look at companies like a One Medical, which is a primary care, pretty, pretty wide, widely uh, uh, raging primary care organization, the first thing people do when they're in One Medical, if they have an issue, is they basically email a service, either the doctor or the, or, or, or the customer service people who kind of figure it out and manage them, right, as opposed to going in to see a doctor. So I think that kind of thing is much more common. I think for people with chronic illness, um, they will be measured and monitored by somebody, whether it's this continuous clinic, whether it's their health plan, whether it's, uh, you know, an actual uh, uh, clinician's office, physician's office. I don't know who will manage most of them, but a lot more of that will be done uh, in 
the, their own home, a lot more management across the continuum of care of, of the, you know, the different pieces that you think of as it gets more acute, as you need intervention, a lot more of that will come to the home or a lot more of that will be managed and they will go out to individual things, for, whether it's blood draws or individual, uh, you know, tests or whatever, or, or, or imaging or whatever it happens to be. That will happen, you know, as part of a, uh, as, as part of a directed activity um, by the organization, which is, which is overall looking after them. Um, what I don't know is how much this will impact the current major purveyors of care, who are the big hospitals, who primarily in the US and elsewhere either make their money or spend most of their time uh, doing a lot of intensive surgery and, and care of, of patients in the hospital or in affiliated uh, surgery centers and, and, and that kind of thing. And I don't know how much of that will be reduced and how much that will be stepped down into lower level systems. I mean, you know, things like nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities or hospitals at home. Um, that trend is starting, but I think, you know, I'd be surprised in 10 years if we had a radical change in the kind of hospitals um, and hospital systems that we have and what they're doing. In 20 or 30 years, it might be quite different. 20 or 30 years, there might be some big changes, but I think, yeah, this is a movement which is starting now and healthcare moves very slowly. Yeah, I agree with you, Matthew. I mean, things take time. Uh, we're seeing these virtual care models emerging and you mentioned before the wearables, the connected devices, the remote patient monitoring, and also the need to do something different around business models. You mentioned the United States, which is a um, very peculiar market healthcare is very I agree. <laughs> yeah it's very expensive and sometimes not at the best standard but um yeah I, I believe some fundamental changes need to happen but i agree with you the the changes always happen very slow today i was having a conversation with someone in here in uk about the nhs and seven years down the line we're still trying to figure out the stuff we're talking about in 2015 you know so that that just confirms what you what you just mentioned moving on with yeah but, but just a quick comment on that one which is that even though the uk you know spent or, or most of europe sorry, the uk spends a lot less money and has a very different organization between its uh, primary care focus and then it's it's, it's hospital it's hospitals you know and you've got these different systems in, in different countries the overall trend you think about it in in healthcare big big picture over the last 20 years and going forward is two things. One is patients are much more intelligent and have much more information about themselves and are going to be generating with wearables and remote monitoring more information, right? So patients and consumers are a bigger part of the equation they were. They're not just being directed around the way they were. That's going to continue to go on. And then the difference in the system, and it's notable in the UK where right, you have the general practitioners and especially in the hospitals, who don't, you know, who barely communicate, really should, like, write letters to each other, send patients there and then just kind of back, you know, don't manage the patient overall. I think in general, that barrier between kind of primary care or even pre-primary care and specialty care where it's needed, that's slowly going to break down because mm -hmm. it's institutional. It's just not rational because it's the same human. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, and I think what we'll be doing is seeing instead of instead of a, essentially, you know, different systems to manage these people, you'll have ratcheting up and down of the amount of management required based on how sick that person is and the needs, you know, so right. uh, I, I think I think I think you're right. But yes, it takes forever. We'll be very old men by the time this is all done. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost quite an old man now. Yeah. I'll be really old by the time we're done. Matthew, thank you. Uh, moving on to the third and last question is, can you share your vision about where the health policy path should go? Oh, oh no. <laughs> now you're asking. Well, I mean, so this is a very different question depending on where you are, right? Uh, in general, with lots of details, you know, in Europe, the kind of idea around universal health care and everyone paying into the same pool, either by taxes or whatever mechanism to cover everybody is kind of solved that problem has more or less been solved in in uh, in the in the in in europe over many many decades right same is true in japan and many developing countries are moving in that direction like taiwan and, and well 
developed by you know, other countries outside of, of, of the, the ones who think about it moving in that direction. Um, the U.S. has still got a massive problem, which is that it really is still, you know, got a doesn't have a universal healthcare system, doesn't really have political um, understanding that that you know we're all in this together, um, and so still has a, has a lot of problems around that. And so it's a very strong private sector, which you know, um, even though the private sector now is all the growth in the private sector has come out of the government programs, especially this Medicare Advantage, which is you know private care provision for the uh for, sorry private insurance provision for people who are over 65. but what i think the underlying commonality of government policy is going to be over the next couple of decades is governments trying to push the healthcare system towards you know essentially delivering better value for the money they're getting um, and the only way to track that is to say are we producing better outcomes for our patients and are, do we have happier patients, right? So I think over time, um, we're gonna be the government saying, can we spend less money and do more with the money we're spending and keep people happy at the same time? So that's gonna be the sort of the overall uh, rubric for, for policy. That probably means spending a bit more time, you know, government spending a bit more time and effort trying to figure out ways to build the institutions that look more like that continuous clinic I've talked about and to pay them for doing the right thing rather than to pay them just to do more things, which is kind of what most countries tend to do. So most countries tend to pay doctors and, and hospitals just to do stuff. And if they're spending too much money, they just pay them less to do the same amount of stuff. Um, the US has done very poorly because it's, it pays them more to do less stuff. But, but that's, you know, that's because of political capture of, of the institutions in the US. You know, change, predicting change in politics is very, very hard. Anyone who can predict politics over the last 10 years has, has been smarter than me. But, you know, mm -hmm. we're, you're living in a country which did a crazy thing five years ago, as did mine. We seem to be recovering, maybe. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. Not sure about the UK, but, uh, but the, you know, the general rubric of where policy should go should be towards can we change the way we think about paying doctors, hospitals, and healthcare organizations? And can we change the way we structure those organizations to break down these barriers between primary care, pre-primary care, primary care, and specialty care and hospital care? And I think that's going to be, you know, the big picture across governments over the next 15, 20 years. But again, it'll be super slow. Great, Matthew. I mean, it's always difficult to predict like uh, precisely, but thank you so much for that insight. We come to the end and I'm not sure if you watch any of the episodes in your podcast. I finish with, a, it's not really a question, it's called One Minute of Fame. You can talk about your work, uh, anything, <laughs> anything, a personal achievement, personal life, anything whatsoever. All right. So over to you to round up One Minute of Fame. All right. Well, uh, I have, I look forward to getting out in the world traveling much more over the next uh, little bit, going to more health healthcare and health tech conferences, seeing you at a few of them, I hope, um, looking at uh, getting over to Europe. Uh, this September, I am going on a mountain bike ride, which is gonna be a five day ride in the south of France, which uh, I was supposed to do in 2020 when I was in relatively good shape and getting fit. I've spent two years sitting on my bum during COVID. <laughs> so I have got a lot of training to do. Meanwhile, I will be hanging out on the healthcare blog. I'll be hanging out, out on Twitter at Balti Boy, correcting all the rights, the wrongs of the world and telling people what they should be doing. And uh, hopefully uh, any of you who want to contact me or see me there will, will, will find me online. But uh, that's my one. That's all I can say in a minute of, of my life. Has to go out, get fit, bike and keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Matthew, brilliant, fantastic. Look, thank you so much for your time, for these amazing insights. I'm going to round up now. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Great pleasure to see you. Brilliant. So for our viewers and listeners, uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also acknowledge our digital health platform, Clinic Touch V and our series partner, Fujifilm Healthcare. And also I'm going to post Matthew's social media, LinkedIn and Twitter here. Make sure you connect with him. He's been doing great work globally for quite a long, a long time in healthcare and digital health innovation. And I'll see you all next week.